currently at the Joan Gallery was inspired by you and your work. Would you tell me that story, please? Well, I had had a show in Utah at a university there. And this uh, uh, person who was a curatorial trainee at the University of Pennsylvania happened to see that show. And uh, she decided she liked what she saw and was interested in the idea of the stages that were found there the uh, various contexts for things. And she uh, decided to do that and was offered a space at a place called Joan, which is in the Benedict Building in uh, downtown Los Angeles. And uh, she had, or somebody, invited two additional artists, whom I don't know, who are part of this same exhibition. Per Prasenia, I hope I'm saying that name right, I understand spans works from the 1970s to the 1990s, starting with yours. Would you tell me about your works that I'm going to see when I go see that? Well, there are varieties of things. There are poly, one polyplanograph, which is a work I did some time ago from a series that were shown at the Whitney in New York. And this is a multi-stage work. It has a series of plexiglass sheets. And I developed a process whereby I would put uh, decals, decal comanias on these. And uh, this is a series of different types of shapes. And shapes, if they're moved into different situations, uh, different contexts, different arrangements, they can mean different things. So that a shape could mean hair in one situation, leaves on a tree in another, uh, stage lights in another. Uh, so it just depended on the way in which these forms were used. And each form has its own emotional resonance to it. So it's a matter of attaching this resonance to the subject matters. And there are certain types of shapes that have a character for which we've got a human reaction. And it, get, it embodies that same reaction in this new context. In fact, I, if I'm thinking of the correct series, I love these two, which are mostly magenta and blue and gradually going in color, because to me, they evoke the reaction of summer and fun. Other works in the show are a drawing called the artist Faust, and it's an artist in a a box, a situation, uh, uh, and in a state of near despondency, or it's it's you know it's a serious in in its nature, and uh, there's a window there. In other of the drawings, the uh, figure jumps out the window <laughs> into oblivion. Then there are a couple of other older paintings that uh, were done with a single shape, a, a, a square that fits into that uh, space. And uh, so I did about four paintings, and each of the uh, has this shape in it, but it's treated differently. It has a different quality. One of the works down there is called the Silver Screen, and another, I, I don't recall the names of paintings very often, uh, but it also has that shape in the context of a kind of living space. And so what happens around that shape is different in each of those works. I tend to work in series anyway, and uh, four was my standard operating method for a long period of time. What goes through your head when you're making something like the silver screen, which has textures? I look at it, and I find myself trying to tell a story, and I think, no, no, just enjoy the art. But what goes through your head when you have a shape, and then you have something that could be red velvet curtains, 
or it could be earth or it could be anything. Could you elaborate a little more? Sure. You're standing in front of your easel and you're creating something like the silver screen. Are you choosing what shapes to put in? Have you already said, I'll use this shape here? Or are you kind of surprising yourself as you draw? I'm surprising myself as I work. Uh, I come from an abstract expressionist background, which was the nature of the art department at Berkeley. Uh, strangely enough, the professors I had there actually started out as plain air painters. They did l landscapes and uh, still lifes and things of that nature, but suddenly they caught the spirit of the abstract expressionist uh, movement, and it made a great deal of difference to them, and it made a great deal of difference to me. I didn't I wasn't surprised by the abstract expressionist nature of the program because I went to Berkeley because I w was an aficionado of that approach to things. So you don't start out with preconceptions of what the work is going to look at, well, like, but discover it in the process of working. And so the important thing is to find a method to start that uh, wheel going. You know, to incite responses and reactions. And not all reactions are the right ones. So you keep trying this and you'll try that. And eventually you'll find uh, the way of the work. So it's kind of a collaboration, but it's like a process of discovery. It's like walking along the shore of the beach and finding a shell here, a rock there, that uh, excites you. And I think that's the way early sculpture started. Probably somebody was walking along and he saw a rock that looked like a figure and worked on the rock a little bit more until it looked more perfectly like that so that other people would get the same kind of response that that person did. And I'm hearing you say that we are creating, kind of creating the reality that we see. Am I understanding you correctly? Well, you see, as an interviewer, <laughs> you ask questions that it differed from the way I would think about things. Uh, my whole idea is to uh, inspire my imaginative life and to create things that prompt revelations uh, that create a, a sense that uh, gets the mind going. And so what is important is what happens after the work is complete. You know, what you create out of what you see. And not everything will do that. Some things are very mundane. And it, it takes a lot of looking, actually, in going to shows to find other artists whose work also inspires that kind of response. It's a, all a matter of what people look at and how they were trained or their background. Uh, some people have just taken a little adult class of, in watercolor, and that that satisfies them, but it doesn't satisfy me as a viewer. And I want to reach people. I do this as a social act that isn't just for me, but it's intended to try to inspire other people. But that depends on their having some corollary background, a background that has something of the same flavor as what I've discovered, you know, what I've found or what I've developed. And the other thing is that it depends on what you read and what you look at. Uh, and th that context is extremely important to the work. It doesn't occur just willy-nilly out of the air, but it comes out of a context. And, 
atmosphere, a world. And so you might not get everything if you don't read some of the same things, which are also inspiring uh, imaginative revelations. You made me laugh out loud with Alberto's at seven. And again, with the idea of context, if I'd never seen a haughty head waiter, I might not find that so funny that we have what could be a haughty head waiter dancing in a pink outfit. Well, that particular big painting, or larger painting, let's put it that way, uh, is inspired by Giacometti. The head on the table there, nobody else will recognize this, I'm sure, but uh, it, it comes from a head in the sculpture garden of the Hirshhorn Museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C. So work comes out of work. And so it's a developing history. It's not something that just happens tomorrow uh, or, you know, today. It's something that has a background that has, where you've become a, a part of the progress of that element. I did also want to ask you about something you said in your artist statement, where you say that laughter is a part of becoming. What do you mean by that? Well, as I was working with abstract expressionist work, I found that I would naturally gravitate toward subject matter, so that it didn't exist outside of, of that kind of realm. Uh, Many abstract expressionists just leave it as form, color, and so forth. And they could be very, very good, but that didn't satisfy me. So as you can see from my work and all the things around here, there are subjects found in those. And as I worked with those subjects, I found that the thing that inspired me and intrigued me the most were things that were untoward and had a kind of humorous nature to them. Now part of that came from looking at works in history, but it also came from reading, uh, reading Evelyn Waugh, reading Flann O'Brien, uh, uh, Tom Sharp, another, so a whole series of, of authors and they uh, did work that is n not the ordinary. It, it sparks not a direct response, but an imaginative response. And uh, that also inspired me. So what happened was that uh, there was a professor at USC who also was interested in works that involved humor and we got together and we convinced the Borchardt Foundation uh, to fund a conference, an international conference on humor and art. And this took place at Chateau de la Bretèche in the town of Misiac in Brittany, France. And we just had a good time selecting the people to invite to come to this conference. Uh, we had Stefan Fortnow, who was from the director of the House of Humor and Satire in Gabrovol, Bulgaria. And they had uh, an archive of thousands of uh, items, which uh, were all about humor. But uh, it was quite different from our sort of humor because uh, theirs had a political bent to it and they were operating against the nature of the society in Bulgaria at that time. But we also had Stephen Prokopov, who was director of the University of Iowa Art Museum and uh, a number of artists and critics from around the world. Uh, the second conference that we had over there 
after we created the visual humor project of, of means of trying to disseminate the ideas of the, about the value of humor uh, in art. Uh, we invited cartoonists, uh, French cartoonists primarily, and they, some of them were from Charlie Hebdo, and some of them died in that, uh, uh, the killing spree that went on in connection with the, the depictions they'd made of the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So, uh, humor can be a very serious undertaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, it can offend people as well as ingratiate them. Mine is the more of the ingratiating type, and my works do not involve uh, any direct references to the politics of the day, but are independent, uh, and independence might be the, the, the key word there. It just shows us how powerful ideas and art can be, and yes. humor. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. I'm looking at what all is surrounding us here. We're sitting in your studio surrounded by your sculpture, your paintings, something a little bit reminiscent of the Sentinel, almost a cutout figure. Would you tell me, I have not seen that work of art from you before, that cutout figure in the corner. What is that, please? It's one of a series of pieces. I mean, there's one of those down in a, a colony in Carlsbad. Uh, I forget exactly where the other is are located at the present time, but uh, they were depictions of figures and they were done in a kind of fanciful way. Uh, <laughs> I don't know just how to describe them, it just, things overtake me. You can see that some things are paintings, some things are drawings, some things are screen prints, uh, some things are sculpture, in bronze, some things are sculpture in wood. wood. So uh, the idea tends to develop out of the medium. And the medium also has its own machinations, own, its own way of working things. Uh, you know, the art is going to tell you how to make it is kind of what I got from what you just said. That's true. For us, that work right there. That screen print was done on a kitchen table in the Highgate uh, section of London. And so I was working with uh, Chris Prater at Kelpra Studio in London, who's the best screen printer in the entire universe. And he'd been working with I think Hockney, uh, but primarily Paolozzi and Kitai uh, on their work. And uh, you, there are certain patterns when you go into a British shop as compared with a shop here. For instance, I went over to Tamarin Lithographic Workshop on invitation and uh, learned how to work with lithography. And I think my first works were not the most exemplary in the world, but I did uh, finally get a hang of it and did some works with which I'm very pleased. And those works are now in the collection of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so anyone going to Washington, D.C. this summer look for Walter Askin and look for some of these works because I would like to see, I am looking at shapes here and I'm looking at dancing figures and I'm looking at a man who could easily be a chef and one who looks like a musician. And then I'm looking at silhouettes and the juxtaposition of color here, almost like you have the shadows of the different people here and then you have the people themselves against a background, but then with almost patterned wallpaper. Well, if you look at that pattern wallpaper carefully in the center section there, and you'll see it's a recreation or a redrawing in alternative colors of Bruegel's The Alchemist. And it's right behind some British 
character types. And then there's this uh, pattern in the background. And then down here at the bottom are a city, another series of British character types, and one of whom is in photographic uh, form. And then there's one figure you see on this side of the work, and the other half of that person, or the, ex, the other third of that person, is on the other side. And that came from the fact that I was doing drawings then, and putting these drawings inside of round s cylindrical uh, plastic pieces. And uh, so I'd make a figure here, go around and meet the other figure on the other side. And you made it work because anyone else would say, oh, I didn't get it centered, but this is fun because we do see two thirds and then one third, and I really like that. And the other work there, Offenbach and Rose, came about because I was in the library. Uh, I was one of the professors who always zoomed in on the library on the day when they put out the new books each week. And uh, you always were exposed to new things through that. And there was a book there on Wagner. And uh, uh, that's often Bach, but other ones were about Wagner. And uh, the stage sets for those pieces inspired me. And so you can see some of the stage set there of a lower level of figure than an upper level of figure. And uh, being there was wonderful too, uh, because I'm a badminton player, or I was, before my knees gave out. And uh, Highgate School was right there. And they had an area there for court tennis, which is like a section of a castle. And somebody started playing with uh, hitting a ball with a, a racket there. And then people kept replicating the section of the castle in order to make this court tennis go. Well, anyway, I went around to the drill hall for the badminton. And uh, it was fascinating because, first of all, uh, they polished the floor to a high sheen. And you're changing direction a lot in badminton. And so the first night, I think a couple of people went home with sprained ankles because they'd fallen down in the <laughs> process of playing badminton there. So the, this is all part of the context. All these sorts of events that occur along the way uh, become a part of what you, the way in which you look at life and the way in which you uh, do things there. It turned out that the place I stayed there was the same place that uh, a fellow had one of my works, Norman Fruman, uh, who moved to uh, the University of Minnesota. And so uh, <laughs> people would see my works up there in, in Minnesota on his wall there. And he had the same uh, woman upstairs who would sing at night in a high falsetto sort of voice. <laughs> Drive you crazy. <laughs> that had to be interesting if you're trying to get some sleep. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is one of those old London houses that's been made over into uh, living quarters for you know, a number of different apartments. So it, and it was managed by a lady who had several of these and she walked around with a parrot on her shoulder. So you can see that esoteric life was alive there. And so I wasn't the only one doing esoteric things. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was, it certainly was not dull. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. I'm gonna brag a little bit about you because I know that you've exhibited all over the world and have taught, but have also received a lot of awards for being an outstanding professor. If you wanted to teach a, a lesson today to the next generation of artists coming up, what would be the first thing you'd teach them about your face with that blank canvas and how do you start? 
Oi, V. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that directly. I would, you know, you can get into a lot of trouble teaching if you don't know the people. And uh, at a state university, you're walking into a room at the beginning of each term with 24 different people. And they each have their own bent. Some come from a Hispanic background, some from others from a Germanic background, others from uh, something quite different. Some are uh, come from uh, Taiwan, for instance. And so they'll each have bring to that class a certain background, a certain set of ideas, a certain flavor. And the biggest problem is when they don't come with any background at all. Mm -hmm. They just decided that they will discover art for the first time or because it is a requirement. So the introductory courses are sometimes the most difficult to teach in that respect. And I ended up teaching a lot of advanced classes rather than uh, beginning classes. And the classes I enjoyed the most were the ones at Berkeley because those people brought things that I could, they would start to work and I could respond to what they were about rather than my instigating what they would be about. But I think I would start with something very open uh, an abstract expressionist in nature, a very free wheeling kind of thing. Because people, when they're beginning, they really didn't get uh, the feel of the medium. And I have been in charge of a number of programs, uh, like the Advanced Placement Studio Art Program, a program on presidential scholars and the arts, which I helped start, and a program for the Arts Recognition and Talent Search, which was down in Miami Beach. And all of those uh, were unique places with unique people. We were talking once again about context here and people bringing stuff. What in the world do you do with somebody that doesn't have a context, that doesn't bring anything with them? <laughs> the best thing to do is to get them to go and look at something. You know, go to a show. Uh, I do some things over at Caltech, and uh, Jim Berry, the teacher there, uh, has a room that's lined with books. And uh, the first thing he has people do is go and look at those books. And I thought that's a very wise thing to do, because they've got to tank up. You've got to be a sponge first and then you can uh, allow uh, the chance to squeeze that sponge and let some of those things come out. <laughs> but you've got to be one who takes in things. You know, I've worked in the manner of Edvard Munch at times when it was, I was a student. And I've worked uh, with ideas that I found in other people's work. For instance, a friend of mine, John Stanley, who was a plasterer, ran a plastering firm. Uh, well, John and, had uh, friends through his father in the trades. And so he said, hey, Walter, come along. Let's go down. And we've been doing mobiles in classes at Pasadena City College. And he said, let's go down to this uh, metal shop. And so he went down there, and we built this great big uh, sculpture. Uh, it had two sea-like shapes that would close in on each other and then open out uh, once again. And it was, uh, you know, we had freedom to do things that we couldn't do in a classroom. And we built the whole thing. And then we said, we did it during the lunch hour of for these uh, folk who were in metal working. And uh, I said, well, what's this gonna cost us? He said, nothing. Because <laughs> 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 his father's contact, it was okay if we just used the materials there. 
And then we entered it in a show at the old Pasadena Art Museum. It used to be something called the San Gabriel Valley Show. It was a wonderful exposition because it covered everyone from Pasadena clear out to Claremont. And uh, this work got in the show. Uh, I had jokingly called the work Magnificent Edifice, which, had, which was just done as a joke. But John liked that title. <laughs> it didn't fit at all. It was just a silly thing to do. But uh, I, uh, so I put, when I, I, would, I was the one who went and entered the show, and I put a duo on it as a title because it had two major uh, moving forms, and then uh, two people had made it, so it seemed suitable to me. Well, it got in, and they hung it from the air conditioning vent because the old Pasteur Museum didn't have what you call a mobile-ready <laughs> situation. So in the night, we'd uh, put it together with fishing line. The, it turned and turned and turned, and each turned one little strand of this uh, string would break. And so, it's, <laughs> and finally, the whole thing fell to the floor. <laughs> so they called us up the next day and they said, uh, you know, your work cut two Armstrong linoleum tiles in two. And I said, we said, well, look what your floor did to our mobile. <laughs> <laughs> so we took a uh, cat gut down, which didn't unwind. And, and reattached the whole thing and put it back up. When the show was over, there wasn't a whole lot of, weren't a whole lot of places to put such things. And so it rested behind my parents' garage for many years, <laughs> deteriorating in various ways. And I kind of like deteriorating things. I like, like the idea that leaves will brown and fall down and things change over a period of time. And I like what happens to sculpture uh, in a, over a period of time. Not always, but most time that I do. And so uh, I went up, back up to my parents' place to retrieve this, but it had gone away <laughs> somehow. As, As it was someone a, took it away? or Oh, it probably was not. A, a mobile thief. <laughs> Got it. It was probably a, a, a trash truck. That <laughs> <laughs> Some people just don't appreciate art. <laughs> it, was a, it was a big piece for sure, yes. <laughs> I didn't want to forget to mention, we've been talking all about art, but I didn't want to forget to mention your books as well. We have Mainstreaming the Muse here, and we have, and just your cute dog. <laughs> well, that one's called... <laughs> Lobsters and Foozlers. Uh, and please tell me about writing that one. Uh, it's being revelatory snippets pertaining to dips, dorks, dweebs, and diplomas <laughs> in the form of uh, fake facts and true fictions. And this book is basically about teaching art and all the esoteric and untoward things that can happen in the process of teaching art. You know, the students who don't do any work or, uh, you know, in other ways uh, don't quite meet the perfect expectation. Foozlers is a real word. I thought you made it up. No, you can foozle a golf shot. So particularly probably on the green with a putter. And Womsters is something I made up. How do you foozle a golf shot? Golf shot. Well, you, <laughs> I don't. I'm not a golfer. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying fake it. It sounds like a foozler is a fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then mainstreaming the muse. That was done in connection with my show down at the Elise Luckman. the Luckman, Luckman Gallery at Cal State LA, 
and it's a big new gallery space they have there. And it's about 30,000 square feet or something like that. And so I was able to show quite a bit of, of work there. And you don't always get to see a whole lot of your things all put together. And you can see it, a lot of the things are over there on the wall and they still are in the wrappings that came back from the show in Utah about two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel better because I'm sitting here surrounded by your prolific art. We've been talking about the books you've read. I'm looking at the sculpture. I'm thinking, when does this man sleep? What is an average creative day like for you? Is there an average? There is no average day. No, it just happens. Uh, I'm an addict. And you'll find that a lot of us who grow, grew up as artists, I started when I was very young, uh, we just keep going at it and we don't want to stop. You know, you, you don't feel alive unless you're doing something. And it, a lot of it is preparatory work. I do a lot of notebooks filled with drawings. So I never have to worry about a place to start because I've always got an impetus of, of possibilities. What was difficult for me was to find other uh, professors of art who only came upon this when they were at college. And you have to have that kind of sense about where you're going or sense of, of the feeling sense for the work. And that comes along very early on. That's why it's important for young people to start early and to get a feel for it rather than to adopt it later on uh, conceptually and intellectually because it just doesn't have the same integrity to it. The two sides of the brain are not in, in concert with one another where the intuitive side and the intellectual side are in concert and operating as one. As we wrap up here, and thank you for your time, if you had to give any kind of advice to these young people, either from your main mainstreaming the muse or anything else from your experience about creating art in addition to start early, what would you say? I, I would not advise them, I don't think. I don't think I would try to direct people. Everybody regards themselves as an artist today. I go down to the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center and do uh, exercises in the pool there, and I find that everybody there thinks of themselves as artists because they do a, a little work of one sort or another. And so uh, the art is prol proliferated on its own pretty much today. People get started from alternative places. You know, they, they're looking at this and that and other things. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Warhola's son, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Warhol. <laughs> Andy, okay. In New York, you know, everybody knows about him, and uh, they all think of him, you know, because a lot of the knowledge of art today comes from money. You know, they, they re people respect money a lot, and I respect the quality of life that art can engender, the thing that can uh, give them energy and uh, a value to what they're doing, rather than to think about what you could sell this for, or who you can get to buy it. And that's one thing that's happened with art today is that a lot of people like uh, Mr. Broad downtown and others uh, have a lot of money and they influence greatly the world of art. Uh, and they will, you get to see what they like, but you don't get to see a, a broad spectrum of what is being done. 
and that doesn't hurt me so much, but it, it, it would be helpful to almost everyone if they could see a broader spectrum of possibilities. Because I know friends of mine who do wonderful work and who are not seen on a regular basis. I mean, I may see their work and they may see my work, but we operated then within a rather closed circle. And uh, the broader the circle, the better. Walter, thank you for your time today. You're welcome, I think. <laughs>